I'm very pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Dave Ulrich. Dave is renowned around the world for his views on human resources. A professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, he is also known as the father of modern HR, the HR thought leader of the decade, and most recently earned Most Influential Global HR Leader 2021, sponsored by People First and HRD Forum. Dave will be sharing his viewpoints on the future of work. So without further ado, Dave. Thank you and uh, others at Talent Canada, especially Melissa, who's done just an exceptional job coordinating. And let me say to those who are attending, you are so lucky to have the sessions on innovation and collaboration, on buy-in, and then it's really exciting to have Zabine speak about leadership as a wrap-up. She is one of the best of the best who's worked at Royal Bank of Canada and really been exceptional. With that in mind, get ready. We're going to have 35 minutes of blitzing, so get ready to go quickly and get your thinking hats on. I'll start by helping you. If you want a copy of the slides, which always exists because I'm going to cover a lot, uh, you can take a picture of this QR code. What I want to do in the next 30 to 35 minutes, uh, by the way, I should have welcomed you to my office, even in a technology world that distances is I think we can actually get close. I learned some things about Marcel by his introducing some of his personal passions earlier. We're going to talk about, and I hope you've got that, HR and the future of work 4.0. I'm going to start with the first two bullets pretty quickly. The world's changing. We can stipulate that, but let's ground ourselves in the reality. Then we're going to talk about what that change means for us in HR. And I'll change an assumption away we think. And then I'm going to provide your Rubik's Cube. Three principles, three contributions, and three agendas. That's nine items. That's a lot of material. So get ready to get your thinking hats on. And if you have comments or questions that come, don't hesitate to share them with Marcel. And either now or in a future time, he'll share them with me and I'll make sure I answer. But let's start with the world we live in. Content is king or queen. This isn't a gender issue, but context is the kingdom in which we work. So what are the contextual events facing your world today, wherever you are? Most of you in Canada, but it could be in Europe. It could be in Kazakhstan. It could be in Israel. It could be in Argentina. Have you experienced any of these things? The COVID pandemic, social injustice, political posturing, more in the US. Obviously, there's no politics in Canada at all global recession, an emotional deficit, and in the heart of that, the digital revolution. Let's just stipulate that that's our context. That's the world in which we live. And so how do we respond to that context? How do we begin to make sense of that context and, and figure out what we do? On the one hand, people feel threatened. Boy, here's a weakness, here's what's wrong. On the other hand, we see that crisis as an opportunity. Many have said a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. What I want to do with you, and you're going to get it with innovation, collaboration, buy-in, and, and then leadership, what can we do to discover opportunity to see this crisis, these crises, and it's not one. Look at all these crises we're in the middle of. Uh, it's not just one. It's a lot of them. Um, political, COVID, injustice, uh, emotion, digital. What can we do to discover value? So that was my first point. The world's changing. The world of work 4.0, whatever we want to call that, is changing. So what does that mean we in HR should do? And I could spend my whole time talking about changes in the work. I'm not going to do it. I want to talk about our response. So let me set you up with a question. What's the most important thing that we as HR or business leaders can give an employee? In that changing world, can we give them, A, a sense of belief, meaning and purpose, two, an ability to become better, to learn and to grow, three, a feeling of belonging, community, relationships, all the above or none of the above. By the way, I've quit doing that as surveys because I always get the same results. In fact, we just did it with a global conference and we got everybody answered for all the above. And it's wrong. What is it we can give an employee today that will help them, an organization that succeeds in the marketplace. Here's the assumption. If we do our internal organizational work, believe, become, belong, but if it doesn't create success in the marketplace, 
there is no workplace. So how do we reframe our HR work and our assumptions about HR as a way to create value in the marketplace? Now, early this morning, I had a conversation with somebody through the internet and I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I hope you'll join me. And they said, Dave, that just means that we're not about greed. We're not about capitalism. That isn't what the yellow box says. It's not about greed. It's about success with our customers in our communities and with our investors, either financial uh, stock or equity or debt or equity. But if we can't connect that, we are in trouble. Here's an example. A few weeks ago, somebody said, or a few months ago, Dave, you were quoted as saying, our people are our most important asset. Well, let me tell you a secret. Every one of you who are listening in have said that at some point or another. I didn't say that. Everybody has said that. But I don't agree with it. Let me change it. Our people are our customers' most important asset. If we're doing things with our people that don't create value for our customers in this new context in Work 4.0, then we're not doing HR work well. That's the agenda. So with that as the agenda, and I started and I said I'd take five or six minutes, I've done it quickly. What is this world of work? The business context is changing, we stipulate it. There's physical problems and changes with the pandemic that are so real and so demanding. There's social justice issues uh, in the United States right now, especially some of that social justice around Black Lives Matter and equity, critical issues. Uh, there's, there's uh, emotional challenges, there's political problems, there's economic challenges. In that new world, we've got to create value outside in. HR is not about HR. It's about what we do to help our organization succeed in the marketplace so that we can then create a great workplace by reading all the great ideas from Talent Canada. And I'm supposed to encourage you to take Talent Canada. So I then come to the question, in Work 4.0, what do we have to pay attention to? I'm going to go through three things. We've got to learn some new principles. How do we rethink this future? By the way, when people say to me, I know the new normal, here it is. My advice to those people is, my advice, uh, what I often say to those people is, so did you buy Amazon, Zoom, and Tesla stock in January of 2000? Because if you know the new normal, you're going to be very rich. I don't know the new normal. I'm not going to pretend to. But I knew, though, there's some principles coming out of the crises that create Work 4.0. Then what, are, what is it in those principles that we contribute? Where do we in HR create unique value? What do we contribute? And what are the implications for HR? So that's a very simple Rubik's Cube. The world is changing. Let's do it again. The world is changing. The business context is new. We know that. We've got to create value. What are three principles? I'm going to suggest three. Boundaries, personalize, and uncertainty. Boundaries. Wherever you've lived, I had the chance of living in Ville Montréal uh, near Montreal for three years. And people would get up in the morning and they'd go to work, either by train or transportation or bus or by car. They'd be at work, and then they'd go home from work. Work was a place. You know, in Work 4.0, in this digital world, work is no longer a place. It's a way to think. It's a set of values. The example I love, and you've heard the story. I don't know where it came from. It's not mine. Somebody's laying bricks, and they say to the bricklayer, what are you doing? And he or she says, I'm laying bricks. A second one says, I'm putting up a wall. A third one says, I'm building a cathedral. Notice the same activity is defined differently. So here's the question. How do I redefine the boundaries of work? It's the same activity, I'm working. I think I've got to change the boundaries of work from focused on, on place to values. So here's the image. It doesn't matter where you work. It's a hybrid work setting. Linda Grad just had a fantastic article in Harvard Business Review. I could be working in an office. I could be at home. Welcome to my office. You get a peek into my office. I could be doing work through my computer or my phone. I could be doing work in an airplane, sitting in, in Toronto at the, at the ocean, watching the beautiful river. I could be doing work in a canoe. That's Marshall's goal. Wherever I am, it doesn't matter. There is a boundary. And the boundary of work is not a place. It's the value I'm creating for my customer. 
Let me say that again. The boundary of work is the value I'm creating for my customer. Ask an employee, what did you do to create value for your customer today? If you don't have an answer, we've not been successful. My job in HR is to make sure that wherever people work, they create value. Principle two in the future, personalized work. This COVID crisis has affected us all differently. I'm sitting in a nice house with my wife. We're older. We've, we've been isolated. Our children who have children at home have been affected so differently. Everyone is affected differently. So we got to personalize work. Two definitions. We got to be personal. Show emotion, show empathy to create experience and energy. There's a power of empathy. I think the job of leaders today, and Zabine will do a brilliant job with that, is to care about the people, to be meaning makers, to care, to show emotion, to show empathy, to build personal energy. And I think we do that by personalizing. I think we will personalize work requirements to every individual. Is it better for you to work at home or in an office? Is it better to you work through technology or face to face? We're going to see boundaries change. We're going to see personalization of work. And third, we're going to live with uncertainty. A year ago, I had laid out my plans for what 2020 would be. None of them almost came to pass. I was busier than ever, but it was uncertain. Some people in a world of uncertainty want to give false hope. This is what's going to happen next. Can't believe it. Some people give up hope, just whatever. How do I in HR create realistic optimism? How do I harness? And I love the word harness. It's like you harness energy, you harness the solar, you harness the sun. How do I harness optimism? We've studied that. And I'm not going to do this. I'm doing this very quickly. You'll get a copy of the slides and anything you want as a paper will we'll work through Talent Canada. You'll get as many essays as you want. We looked at the military with VUCA, vol volatility, uncertainty, complexity. We looked at physics with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We looked at healthcare. We looked at finance with Rick's. We even looked at religion with uh, faith as part of uncertainty. There are tools we can use to harness uncertainty. I tame my apprehensions. I envision a future, I regulate, I experiment, I collaborate. Take a breath. I've given you three principles in this new world of work. By the way, I know I've covered a lot. I think I'm gonna stop for just a second and Marcel, if you're following and tracking, are there any comments in chat or in questions that come out that, that you think I should pay attention to? So Marcel, if you're there, uh, I'm not tracking the chat and and uh, maybe Marcel's not there. That's a, that's a dangerous thing to have asked. Does anything jump out, Marcel, that I should pay attention to? I've laid out the overall change. The world is changing. 4.0, we got to create value. We got to get these principles in our mind. Just a minute or two that we have. I'm still trying to manage time here. Yeah, Dave, everything you've shared has been excellent thus far. We've had no questions in the Q&A yet. Super. If you've got one or two, don't hesitate. Marcel, do you see boundaries changing? Do you see personalization and uncertainty? Do you see those as kind of new agendas in 4.0? I do. I do too. By the way, they excite me and they scare me <laughs> because I like traditional boundaries. I like there to be certainty. So what does HR, let me move on then. In that new world, that new cup, what does HR contribute? Again, I love the world of simplicity. My PhD, and, and nobody likes to talk about their PhD, they like it to be done. I'll share something a little more personal since I'm in my office. I found it when I started doing webinars. This is my dissertation, and it's a numerical taxonomy. Numerical taxonomy is the science of simplicity out of complexity. So I did, I was a statistics PhD. And by the way, when you did a PhD in the 1980s, university microfilms did uh they sold them so i kept the check for 35 years i made 11 dollars 85 for my phd um in other words numerical taxonomy was not a bestseller i love simplicity why do i say that in this world of 4.0 with uh boundaries new a uh, new world of work an uncertainty and a different way of living what does HR contribute? When we in HR come to a business meeting, what do we bring? Talent, my fingers. Do we have the right people, the right individuals, the right workforce? 
Talent Canada, the name of the company, focuses on that. We also bring a great organization. Talent is the raw ingredients. It's what I do to make my food. If I'm going to make great poutine, and that shows you I actually lived in Montreal, I ate it. I've got to have great potatoes. I've got to have great cheese. I've got to have great cheese curds. I've got to have great ingredients. But they come together in a unique way. And then the third is leadership. I sit in a business meeting, whatever the meeting is in HR, and I ask three questions. Given our business's goals, do we have the right talent? My fingers. Do we have the right organization? My fist. And do we have the right leadership? They both matter. Our research shows that organization, my fist, has four times the impact on business results than talent. We fight a war with people. We have victory through organization. How do I then in HR make sure that I bring the right talent, organization, and leadership to be successful at what we do? So we've studied talent. We've written books on that. Again, in the spirit of simplicity, we've said talent has three dimensions that we work on. Do our people, our employees, have the right competence? A, do, do we bring the right people in? Have we acquired the right raw ingredients? Have we got the right skills, the right skill set, technically, socially, culturally, have we oriented them? B, have we moved people through the organization? Number two, have we managed employee performance? Have we developed our employees? Number four, do we have careers? Number five, communication. Six, critical issue today, diversity, equity. C, have we done a flow of people? Have we retained our best? And have we eight managed departing employees? A, B, and C give me competence. And in the world today, we've got to have the right competence. We've got to have the right raw ingredients. D gives me commitment. Now that I've got people in the organization, are they doing their best? Competence, A, B, and C, is the brains, the knowledge, the skills. Commitment is the hands and the feet. Are we improving? Are we tracking employee engagement? Most consulting firms, Gallup, Deloitte, BCG, Bain, Booz, all have engagement indices that are terrific. E in the talent space is, are we getting contribution? Competence is the, the brains, the knowledge. Commitment is the hands and feet. Contribution is the heart and soul. Are we giving employees a great experience? We believe that those 10 areas in talent, acquiring talent, performance, developing and careers, communicating, diversity, retaining, departing, engagement and experience, are 10 initiatives that I, as a talent manager or HR manager, can bring to a dialogue to be more successful. We need great talent. Remember, talent matters, an organization matters more. So what's the logic of an organization? I love this metaphor. It's about three years old now. A woman is on the beach in the United States in Florida with her two sons and her mother. The eight and 10-year-old boys get in the water. They get pulled out in a riptide. The mother jumps in. The grandmother jumps in. Four or five people from the ocean or the beach jump in. There's eight or nine people in a riptide at great risk. Within a matter of minutes, you can look at the YouTube. I won't show it. A human chain exists with 70 to 80 people who are holding arms and they save those people. Take a step back. What just happened? Talent matters. If Michael Phelps, the greatest swimmer in the history of the world, had been on the beach, he couldn't have saved those eight people. But they formed an organization. They formed a team that responded to a challenge and opportunity, and they were successful. Can we do that in our organization? This is a busy slide. Just look across the top with me. Traditionally, my organization was a hierarchy. I had a role. I had a rule. I had to go live in my hierarchy. I knew my position. You see the books about that, bureaucracy, re-engineering. Then the organization is a system, the 7S framework, the McKinsey organization, the design, the star model. And I align all the pieces. Then we're a set of capabilities. What are we good at doing? What's our capability? Then we need to become market-oriented. We need to have capabilities that succeed in this market. We did a book on that called market, or Reinventing the Organization. And notice, in this case, they came together to solve a problem, which was to save those people in the riptide. 
Now we need to pull resources together to build capabilities to build an organization. What does that mean? Let me give a story and a quick example. Our son, oh, I'm going to show a picture. I didn't know if I'd have time, but I do. I'm moving quickly. Our son finished his PhD. Um, here's our son. And we said, what would you like for a PhD gift? And he said, I'd like to go to Disney. And so our family went to Disney. 16 of us, because our daughter said, I want to go to Disney. Our other daughter said, I want to go to Disney. So a few years ago, 16 of us showed up at Disney. And I'm so, sort of miserable. Why am I miserable? Because it's hot, it's humid, it's sweaty, it's expensive. And we had to rent four rooms for three nights. And as a result, I don't get to buy a new car. So I'm grumpy. The woman takes a picture of us, says, oh, this is the happiest place on earth. And I said, not for me. This is kind of painful. Hang on, you'll get it. Well, a day later, we're visiting. We go in to see Snow White and Cinderella, and I don't know which one this is, and our grandchildren, our daughters and our grandson, look at her, and they stop, and they stare, and they look at me and say, Grandpa, she's real. We've seen the movie. We've read the books. Grandpa, she's so beautiful. Grandpa, we love you. Now everybody's going, oh, what a sweet story. I'm not going, ah, oh. I'm going, oh, this is a disaster because we're going to have to go back to Disney. And guess what? The next year I had to take our family to Disney again. We did a Disney cruise because that's what we wanted to do. Okay. Why do I go through that stupid story? Look what Disney's done conceptually. Take a step back. They build an internal culture. Their purpose is to be the happiest place on earth. They have values, beliefs. Their culture was the roots of their tree. But look at what they did. The outside in view of culture. Culture was their brand, their identity, their image. The image that they created on that Disney experience got our grandkids to go to Disney and our daughter-in-law, and they got me, the father, or the grandfather who's paid the bill, to be delighted. Because when my granddaughters and grandsons look at me and say, oh, grandpa, we love you, I'll pay for that. Your culture is not your values. Your culture is not your values. That's the roots of the tree. Your culture is the identity of your firm with your customers that cause them to come back again and again. Our job in HR, our contribution is to build a great set of talent, my fingers a great organizational culture focused outside in like Disney has done well. And the connection, and I'll leave it to Zabine to really lay this out, is to build a leadership brand. Leadership is not just about the skills our leaders have, but the skills we have so that our customers have a great experience. We've written about how do you do that. You'll get an example at the end of this session today uh, with Royal Bank of Canada to show that we built a business case, an agreement. We had steps to build a brand. Take a breath. I laid out that the world is changing 4.0. We know that. We've got to create value. I think we sort of know that. It's not what we do, it's what somebody gets. We've got three principles in this new world. Change boundaries, personalize work, and harness uncertainty. Our contributions are talent, organization, and leadership. I'm going to stop again very quickly, Marcel. Are there one or two ideas that seem to gestate in the chat or others? And if not, I'll move to the final. What does this mean for HR? But I hope this is going quickly, but I hope you're engaged and paying attention. It's fun. Dave, there is a couple of questions just about uncertainty. Okay. And Cindy says, I completely agree with harnessing uncertainty. Any tips on how to approach that as a strategic intent with executives who do not buy into this approach? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your comment. Go to your executive and say, three months ago, what would you have predicted would be happening today? Or if you want to do another test, I'd like to give you a time capsule. Write down on a sheet of paper. These are my notes for my session today. Write down on a sheet of paper what you think is going to happen four weeks, eight weeks, six weeks in today. Who's going to win the Stanley Cup? Write it down. You know what? We don't know. And so instead of giving false hope, and I could do more in Stanley Cup. Let's harness it. Let's make that uncertainty good. And we had six items or five items that I'm more than happy to share with you. And Marcel, if you or Melissa will ask, 
I'll share an essay that you can share with everybody that goes through what are the six items for getting it. But get executives to say, I'm not afraid of uncertainty. The first item on our five, by the way, is tame your apprehension. Most of us don't harness it because we're afraid of it. Tame your apprehension. What's the worst thing that can happen? And then see and envision a future. Now I'm going through the five items, but, but harness that uncertainty. Marcel, do you want to do one more question? And then I've got uh, 10 minutes left. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Scott asks, while I thrive on uncertainty, how do I ensure our resulting pace of change and innovation is sustainable? I don't know. By the way, Scott, if you can bottle a formula for revitalization and re-energizing, let me know and we'll sell it together. And then, uh, and then we won't be at this. No, I'm joking. Let me give you a way, Scott, to think about it. I'm going to give you two axes, Scott. One axis is the demand. Uncertainty, pressure, change, high on the demand. So this is my hand, high on the demand. The other axis is resource, resource. When we live in high demand, uncertainty, boundaries, all the changes that we've got, we have to find resources to cope. Our job in HR is to give employees resource. We can't remove the demand. The uncertainty is real. The personalization is real. The hybrid organization is real. So what are the resources we can give our employees? Technology is a resource. You're going to hear about that. Uh, Buy-in is a resource. You're going to hear about that. A team to work with is a resource. Flexibility over my work is a resource. When the demands are high, we've got to provide resources. And so, Scott, the question I'd say is, what resources do I have? Let me give you one. Every time I coach business leaders, uh, that's not true. Almost every time I coach, my final question in coaching, are you taking care of yourself? The greatest resource I think we can give ourselves is self-care. That means different things. For some, that may mean, by the way, don't do that through substance abuse. Uh, I don't think alcohol and, and substance abuse is a great way. Alcohol may be a way to resource it, but is it diet? Is it nutrition? Is it sleep? Is it relationships? Is it weird stuff? In the 90s, my greatest resource, I should show, there's my television sitting in my office right over there. My greatest resource in the 90s with Seinfeld, I have no idea why. And I'm confessing here a little bit. I'm struggling, I'm tense, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged. Watch two episodes of Seinfeld. For me, that worked. By the way, that probably wouldn't work for you. My wife, who's a very good psychologist said, what's going on? And I said, Seinfeld is a resource for me. She watched me, she said, I get it, you're George. <laughs> anyway, bad joke. What's your resource? Principles. The world is changing 4.0. Three contributions, talent organization. What does that mean for us in HR? Three things. Do we have the right HR department? We've written books. I'm not going to bore you with that about the evolution of the HR department. I want to make a very, very, very simple point. Many people, when they say build a great HR department, they talk about yellow. Get the HR design right. How are we structured? And the big buzz right now is let's create these pools of resources with almost no boundaries and let's create an agile HR organization in a scrum. Not a bad idea. By the way, I don't agree. I think you've, you've, got to, you've got to have some differentiation between those pools. But let me tell you a better idea. Our work over the last 25 years in HR is that the HR department is not the only thing that makes great HR. In fact, we've looked at nine dimensions of a successful HR department, and we've done research. I'll share briefly in just a minute. The department that we have is not as important as the green, the relationships that we have. Here's what we found. If you in HR can form great relationships among your HR team and with your business leaders and with your employees and with customers and investors outside, that HR department will have more business impact. The structure of HR works. The relationships matter even more. Next, we got to have the right skills of HR. We've studied HR competencies for 30 years. We've done seven rounds. We are just finishing the analysis on the eighth round of data. You may hear my phone. That says we're live. Stick with us. We found that for HR to create value, there are a set of skills we should master in the middle. 
you've got to be a credible activist in green, in red. That's what invites you to the table. That's still true. We got to be trusted advisors. You got to be a strategic positioner in blue. You got to accelerate business. That's what we're finding in this round. And in the middle, you've got to navigate paradox. You've got to turn complexity into simplicity. Are we in HR skilled to do the work? And the final part of HR is, can we use information and analytics to make a difference? For me, this is so exciting and so critical. In the analytics and HR space, we start at the bottom with benchmarks and scorecards. I did a book, The HR Scorecard, with two brilliant colleagues. Benchmarking tells me, how do I compare with someone else? How do I compare with another bank, with another... How do I compare my food with Tim Hortons? How do I compare with someone else? Then we get insights. We go get best practice. Who's the best at innovation? Who's the best at collaboration? Who's the best at buy-in? Some of the things you'll hear. Then we get intervention. Let's go study that best practice. Where I hope that we go in HR is impact and guidance. Benchmarking, how do I compare? Best practice, what is somebody else doing? Guidance, what should I do? I love the metaphor of guidance. What's my career? How do I personalize it? What do I do in retirement? What do I do in investments? What do I do with my technology? And how do I get guidance? I'm tracking my 35 minutes. Guidance is not a descriptor, it's a prescription and it starts with outcomes. Guidance always starts with what do I want to accomplish? What is my company trying to accomplish with my employee, strategy, customer, financial, and business results? What are we trying to accomplish? What are the outcomes? And then we say, given those outcomes, do I have the right talent? And I just took you through talent very quickly. Do I have the right organization? I just talked about organization very quickly. Do I have the right leadership, the combination? And do I have the right HR? For us, that's called human capability, human capital. Talent, leadership, organization, and HR. Now comes the magic question. You won't be able to read this. I have five columns. These are the outcomes. Employee, strategy, customer, financial, community. I got four colors of things I can do in talent, leadership, organization, and HR. We've broken them down and I did that quickly. All in all, I got 185 cells. So where in the next 12 months in work 4.0, with new boundaries, personalization, and uncertainty, should I invest in those 185 cells? That's guidance. This is the research we've done to date. It's a beta test. Uh, you can get, I'll show you how to access this. It's free. We have over a thousand. I think we have 1400 companies now who've taken the test. The green in each column, I now can show where in dark green I should invest. Let me show you with HR down at the bottom. Look at the aqua at the bottom. Why did I talk about relationships so critical? Look at the dark green cells at the bottom. If I want to deliver strategy, customer and financial results, the relationships matter more than the design of the department. In fact, more than almost anything. We now have data in talent, organization, HR and leadership of where you could invest. And you can do this for free. It's our giveaway. I know Alan Todd is on the phone from Corpio. We don't have time, Alan, to get your comments, but I hope people can say, go to rbl.ai, fill out a survey. We've got, two, uh, we've got uh, 14 or 1500 companies who've done it. Find out where you should invest to go forward. Whoa, I've gone fast. What's the world of work 4.0? The context is changing. We've got to change our assumptions. HR is not about HR. It's about creating value. Our fundamental assumption is that HR is about success in the marketplace, not about talent for us, but our customer. And there's three principles, boundaryless, personalization, and uncertainty. There's three contributions, leadership, talent, and organization. And there's three agendas, the HR department, the HR professional, and the HR people. I'm going to end, and uh, I don't know if we have time for a question or not. I'll let Marcel decide. My end is always where I begin, with an optimism. The best is yet ahead. The best is yet ahead. Please learn with me, with Talent Canada, and with others. 
you can get a copy of the slide, visit me on LinkedIn. But remember that the best is yet ahead. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.